We're going to wait for people to keep coming in. And we have a couple of protocols. Um, if you've been on these webinars before, this should look familiar, but mostly um, being respectful of speakers. So making sure to keep your lines muted and being sure to not talk over each other, but to chat over each other. Um, and I'm really excited for our webinar today. I can go ahead and in introduce myself as people are coming in. Uh, my name is Vary DeSuvero. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am currently on Dena Ina, Denaina Lands. Um, I'm really excited to see you all. Um, although there's so many of you, it's hard to see you all on the same screen. So um, we're gonna just wait maybe one more minute um, before we get really, really started. Um, and, oh, and I'm the executive director of ACPERG, the Alaska Public Interest Research Group. Um, and why don't we, Chanel, I think I'm going to turn it over to you. I just wanna welcome you all again. And um, while you're waiting, a lot of you all are putting it in already, but, um, you can put your name, your pronouns um, in the chat. And I actually, Jessica, did you wanna play a song? Yeah, I'm just gonna play a song while we wait um, a little bit. We'll start at 1135 so we can get everyone admitted. Awesome. Hey, welcome to everyone who's joining. We're going to get started in two minutes. And so looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you for that pump up music. <laughs> um, welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Vary DeSuvero. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm right now on Denaina lands, Denaina lands. Um, and I was just flipping through to see everyone's faces. And it's so good to see you all. Um, welcome to our third webinar in this series. Um, I'm going to stop talking soon, but I'm just 
really, really glad that you're all here and glad to be in this space together. So I hope uh, we can all take a deep breath and be present, as present as you can be um, for this webinar and uh, to be here together and to hear from all of our awesome speakers. Um, if you haven't yet, you can put your name, your pronouns and the indigenous lands that you're on in the comment box. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Chanel. Hi, everyone. I'm Chanel, as very said. Um, you can call me either Chanel or Gavang Sach, or Gov for short. <laughs> um, I'm with the Alaska Center. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm here today to offer up a land acknowledgement. <clears throat> so starting out, we acknowledge that we're in the ancestral, unceded, traditional territory of Alaska Native peoples throughout the state that indigenous peoples have never surrendered these lands or these resources to Russia or the US. And that in thanks to these communities who've stewarded and cared for these lands, we're able to live here. Um, but also in recognition of the historical and ongoing legacy of colonialism. So I understand these land acknowledgements in the context of some very impressed upon words from my elders back at home in the lower Yukon Delta, <laughs> um, that above all we value respect. And <laughs> the respect comes with three main tenets. Um, that number one, we respect each other, our peers, our elders. Number two, we respect our lands, the animals, the waters. And Number three, we respect ourselves. Um, knowing that without any one of these three tenets, we're unable to respect ourselves since the land that we live on, the waters that we go by, they're literally and spiritually a part of all of us from the food that we eat to the places that we can play. <laughs> So I'd like to extend my deepest thanks to the Dena'ina people who have had an excellent job of stewarding these lands that I now get to enjoy in their territory. And I hope that with starting with these webinars, um, we can all carry forward that same level of respect that's born of love and joy. <laughs> So with that, um, we're going to carry forward with the agenda and our co-hosts. Um, first, our co-hosts introductions. There's six co-hosts, um, Fireweed Collective, Native Peoples Action, Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition, the Alaska Center, the Alaska Public Interest Research Group, or ACPERG, <laughs> that you heard from Barry, and Native Movement. <laughs> Together, the six of us have created a four-part agenda for you today, um, starting with the Just Transition Framework, which will provide a deeper understanding of the goals we're trying to move forward um, with towards this regenerative economy based off of Indigenous ways of knowing. Um, with this framework, we're going to move forward towards guest speakers who have examples of how they're applying this framework to their own work. Uh, I think there will be three of them. And then after that, we'll move into a fishbowl with a discussion about how we can continue with this work um, and how we can move forward in the future to create a just recovery <laughs> from this moment of crisis. And after that, we'll have closing thoughts. So with that, I would like to pass on to Carly and David. Thanks all. Thank you, Chanel. Hi, everyone. Hola, que tal? Chamai. My name is Carly Weir. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And today I'm calling in um, from the Denaina and Supiak lands, the borderlands, um, and an area which is now called Homer. Um, and I share these words um, with deep gratitude for the original caretakers of these lands um, that I now call home. Um, and it's just uh, a, a real beauty to do this work with these 
with, with these lands. Um, I work with Native Movement and alongside many of the partners um, on this call, and we're helping to support this conversation, this ongoing conversation about just transition in Alaska. And we hope you'll continue to join us and be a part of this really important conversation. So I'm gonna share just a little bit about the Just Transition framework um, to help ground our thinking today. And for those of you who've been on these webinars before or attended the summit, um, this may be a little review, but I hope you find, um, as I do, that the more I think about and look at this framework, the more I recognize the work that needs to be done and the work that we're all doing right now for a just transition in Alaska. So the just transition framework was created really out of labor and environmental movements who recognize that uh, transition away from a fossil fuel extractive based economy um, is inevitable. Um, but how it's done is, is up to us. Justice is not inevitable. It takes work and care and creativity. And so the Just Transition Framework um, really puts forward a path um, to a fair shift to an econ economy that's both sustainable and equitable and, and just for all. Um, so before we get into the framework, I think it's important to take a moment and uh, remember what the word economy really means. So on this next slide, um, you know, we, we can see that the, the word eco means home, um, ecosystem, um, really our home um, relationships, how these uh, different elements of a, of a system work together. Um, and that ecosystem can be, as I heard yesterday, um, as small as a raindrop or as big as the watershed of Bristol Bay or greater. Um, ecology then means um, the study of our home, right? Um, and then economy actually means the management of our home. Um, I think it's really important that we all work to reclaim this word economy, right? Um, it's not just the GDP or stock tickers or some, um, nebulous creation by the Fed, right? We are all economists. We are all managers of our home. Um, and as we see this work for a just transition, it's up to us um, to, be, to be good managers of our home. So the next slide, this framework was created by um, some really um, good deep thinking by a group called Movement Generation. And on the left side, um, we can see elements of the extractive economy. Um, or a way of managing our home that's based on exploitation and extraction. It's where many of our societies are living right now, right? Um, it's a world dominated, um, it's a, excuse me, a, a, an economy dominated by a worldview um, that's based in consumerism and colonialism and white supremacy and patriarchy. Um, it's based on exploitation of our people, our workers, our work wealth, as well as our natural resources that are just um, uh, dug up, burned, extracted, buried um, in this sort of false cycle. Um, and then, of course, the governance of this, right, is militarism. Um, and the, the purpose for this extractive economy, this way of managing our economy, the purpose of this extractive one is to enclose wealth right, to, to put wealth and power in the hands of few. Um, and I think it's pretty easy for us to see um, examples of the, exact, of the extractive economy happening right now um, during this recovery from these crises. Um, but on the right side, we see um, what we all know is possible, what we feel is possible, right? This living and regener regenerative economy. Um, and the worldview that encompasses this is based on caring and sacredness for each other. It's based on regeneration and reclamation of our natural resources. It's based on cooperation um, instead of exploitation. And um, it's governed, I think, by um, what we all also know is possible of true, deep, participatory, local democracy, true democracy. Um, and I think the purpose, which we again all know is possible of this living economy, is for ecological and social well being of all of us, not just the few. And then in this framework, you also see um, some of the ways we get from the extractive economy over to the living economy, right? Um, we need to, of course, stop these, these bad false solutions and help build and demonstrate the new. We also need to draw down wealth and power to a local level. 
um, to some, some uh, self-governance. We need to invest in our solutions and our communities and our power. Um, and take a little bit of time if you're not familiar with this framework, I think um, it provides really good thinking and how we do our work and the work we're doing right now for a just transition. And then the next slide, um, this next slide recognizes that indigenous economies have this deep knowledge of managing home for the purpose of ecological and social well-being. And in many cases, for many generations, for seven generations out, um, this framework was created by Native movement. Um, and it's, it's not meant to romanticize or homogenize Indigenous cultures or Indigenous economies, but instead to show that we can remember our way forward, that this knowledge is there. Um, and, and one of the ways we remember our way forward is in part by recognizing indigenous economies. And so for our, our work here in Alaska, especially, right? Um, the recognition of indigenous economies and indigenous ways of managing home are essential to our path forward. And it's also why tribal sovereignty and self-governance is a critical part of a just transition here in Alaska. Um, so today we're gonna hear from some amazing speakers and I think you'll see themes of all of this woven through their talks. Um, and next, we're just gonna take a little look at um, the, a framework that helps us talk about recovery through these crises, right? We're in these interwoven crises of climate crisis, health crisis, economic crisis. And so how we build forward out of these um, really sets a path forward. Um, so I'm so, so excited that you're here and for the rest of these uh, speakers today. And I'm gonna turn it over to David now to talk about Just Recovery Framework. Thank you, Carly, for that um, illuminating overview of the Just Transition Framework. My name is David Song, and I'm an economic justice organizer with ACPERG and Native Movement. Um, pronouns are he, him, and I'm calling in from Aquan and Takoquan lands in Juneau. So um, now that we have that bird's eye view of how we want to restructure our economy, how do we as activists, organizers, and community members use that knowledge to inform our response to the current crisis? How do we move from an extractive, destructive economy to one that considers the needs of everyone, especially in the light of the current pandemic? So for that, we have um, something called the Just Recovery Model, which is a template for post-disaster organizing efforts. Um, and we wanna give credit to the activists in the Climate Justice Alliance and Our Power Puerto Rico, who developed these concepts in response to the natural disasters that devastated the region. So in the Just Recovery Model, we have three main pillars, respond, recover, and rebuild. Um, and on the next slide, um, we have um, a little diagram. So on the left, we have the status quo. Um, and on the right, we have our three pillars with examples of each that we've seen in Alaska. So um, just to recap, response, um, that was the focus of our last webinar. And it refers to assistance that really um, actually listens to and addresses the immediate needs of impacted communities in a just way. And this is distinct from aid, which is the typical band-aid that's given to us from large NGOs and government agencies. So in our current crisis, aid looks like the, the one-time payment to families that have been struggling for months and months, or um, small business funds that are being funneled to giant corporations. Um, on the other hand, the examples of response that we've seen in Alaska are things like mutual aid networks like NANA, or neighbors helping their elders and immunocompromised people with errands, um, and businesses that are shifting to produce free and low cost PPE, et cetera, et cetera. So in other words, response is listening to and working in collaboration with people on the front lines to address the immediate fallout of the crisis. So recovery, um, which is the focus of today's webinar, um, consists of the structural changes that we need to put in place in order to transition to a just society. This is distinct from extraction. So right now, capitalists are extracting resources without abandon to enclose as much wealth as possible, something that we're very familiar with in Alaska. So we've seen people taking advantage of our current crisis by price gouging essential items um, like hand sanitizer and PPE, which is neither just nor sustainable. We see businesses in our supply chain extract low cost labor from vulnerable communities without hazard pay. 
I'm sure you can think of many other examples. So for the rest of this webinar, we're gonna be discussing alternatives to this extraction, including telehealth and food security networks. Um, and the final part of the just recovery model is rebuild, um, sometimes reimagine, which is um, which are the long-term visionary solutions that will leave our community stronger than before this crisis. And that's gonna be the focus of the next webinar, which I'm really excited for. But since this webinar is about recovery, I'm going to pass it on to Ine, who will provide further context for the rest of our conversation. Unmute myself. Oh, there. Thanks. I couldn't unmute myself. Um, <laughs> uh, Yat uh, uh, Vanguinzi, Shoji Ine, Bike Oji, Kachini Nishlanto, Dojini Bashishin, Navajo and Tana Artham, and I am um, learning some Gwichen. My kids are Gwichen and Navajo and Tana Artham and Germ Jewish. Um, and I'm the executive director of Native Movement and very honored to just kind of kick, help kick off this webinar with these beautiful fiddleheads making me hungry. Um, <clears throat> as David said, you know, this, this uh, webinar is really focused on the recovery piece of, of um, this time that we're in, right? And, and so what is this time? Um, if you've if you've been to any of the other just transition sessions, uh, there's been talk, we've talked a lot about shifts, times of major shift, um, uh, and, and we're in one of these times, right? We're in a time of global shift of really, uh, our communities are really changing. And, and we're also in this time of like, of crisis in, in a lot of ways. <clears throat> So in these times of, of crisis and shift, I know what I've been seeing a lot is uh, this moment really helps us to illuminate the infrastructure that we have or don't have currently within our communities. Um, and I'm trying to, I should not try to read the chat while I talk. Um, so, so yeah, so we're in this time of really looking at the infrastructures that we have in our community, whether it's very locally or on the state level or even or nationally and globally, and uh, recognizing, okay, what there are many things that maybe are in place to help us navigate this time. And there are many things that aren't in place um, and people are falling through the cracks. And, and so when we think about recovery outside of extractive e recovery, right? Where we've got examples say the the housing market collapse in 2008 where you have big, big companies buying up land <clears throat> or housing um, in this very extractive manner um, how are we changing that how are we taking this moment to plant the seeds that uh, that will grow the infrastructure that we need not only for this time but for the long um, for the long haul and so that's what this session will really focus on. Uh, what are those? What are the some of the projects that are already being ha already happening, um, and how are we doing that in a way that's building equity and justice? Right? How are we planting these seeds of of equity and justice into into a community response of recovery outside um, and away from extraction? Uh, and so with that, I just want to introduce, we've got some really great webinar planned and I'm going to introduce Kelsey, who is going to introduce our speakers. Thank you. Mani Eagle River Ami Wita Dunga, Denaina Esneniami. 
Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kelsey Juven Wallace. I am originally from Bethel, but today I'm calling in on the Dena'ina or Dena'ina lands um, near the native village of Ikutna. My pronouns are she, her, uh, and I come to this space as a Yupik mama and also um, as the communications director for Native Peoples Action and Native Peoples Action Community Fund. And I have the pleasure of announcing, or not announcing, but introducing our guest speakers for today. Um, we have Garrett Spargo, Dr. Jessica Black, and Leila Leila Pyle. Uh, Garrett Spargo is Aleut and Unangan, uh, originally from the island community of Sandpoint. And he is current, or he's the audiovisual and video conferencing manager at ANTHC. And he also serves as the principal investigator for ANTHC's health resources and service administration funded telehealth technology assessment resource center. And today he's joining us to speak on telehealth, um, give us, you know, example or tell us exactly what it is, what is telehealth, how it's working, and why it's important that we continue keeping telehealth moving forward as a long-term solution. We also have Dr. Jessica Black. Uh, she is Gwich'in Athabascan from the villages of Gwich'aje, Fort Yukon, and Ninana, Alaska. She is the assistant professor at the Department of Alaska Native Studies and Rural Development and Tribal Management at UAF, where she teaches um, and she co-leads research projects and serves uh, Alaska Native communities in various ways. She will be sharing about food security and food sovereignty from an Indigenous perspective. And then we also have Layla Pyle, who is the lead educator at Calypso Farm and Ecology Center. She grew up in Kodiak on Sukhbak and Alutik lands, and she now lives and works in Fairbanks in her current role at um, Calypso Farm, where she leads hands-on youth education programs and community outreach as well. She is also a community organizer with Fireweed Collective, and today she's going to share about you know, the health aspect of communities in regards to um, as well as Calypso's response in putting people's health first and building resiliency to recover as um, an organization and communities. Super excited to hear these folks who are creating and remembering a new way forward. Garrett, we might have lost Kelsey. Do you mind jumping in? Not at all. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're great. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, I'm uh, Alakishu, uh, Garrett Spargo Adukta'e. Uh, my name is Garrett Spargo. Uh, as mentioned, I'm originally from Sandpoint, Alaska. Um, my work in telemedicine uh, has been uh, interesting, to say the least. COVID obviously has introduced a whole host of challenges. Uh, to how we work, how we learn, and how we play. And uh, that's doubly true, I would say, in, in healthcare, where not only are we having to figure out how we manage this new infectious disease and how we handle the pandemic preparation and response, but we also still need to see our patients. Not all healthcare right now is COVID care, although sometimes it feels that way. Uh, we still have patients with acute and chronic conditions that need access to healthcare. And telemedicine has really played a pretty big part in that. Uh, and it's really about increasing access to healthcare. Uh, now, uh, on, on the next slide, uh, I'm going to do a really quick kind of resource dump for a bunch of you because telehealth can be a really big topic. We uh, can spend hours and hours talking about some of the uh, methods and modalities, the appropriate use cases, challenges. Um, in this little introduction, I won't have time to do the deep dive that I might usually do. So I'll, I'll lay out these, these groups. Uh, there are the telehealth resource centers that uh, are federally funded groups that provide technical assistance on telemedicine. Uh, there's a national consortium of them, uh, and that's their main website there, the telehealthresourcecenter.org. Uh, 
Uh, within that group, there's a regional um, Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, they provide support specifically to Alaska and some other states in the Northwest. Uh, and so they can help talk about uh, program design and telehealth development and design, answer a lot of basic foundational questions. We also have a really useful group uh, that's a national group called the uh, National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. Uh, they're based out of California. They do a state by state map of policies. They track what's happening, uh, what's been enacted, what's currently uh, being debated on various Senate and Congress floors. And they, uh, in response to COVID actually have produced some COVID handy guides that kind of talk through what's changed in how we can and cannot deliver care in the time of COVID. Uh, and then we also have the uh, Technology Assessment Center, which is based here in Alaska at ANTHC, and we uh, focus on technology assessment and selection uh, because there really is some important work that needs to get done to make certain the telehealth are trying to do, the technology you're trying to implement fits within in your community and within your needs. Uh, there's another group called ATA. They're the American Telemedicine Association. They're uh, another national group. Uh, they, they both have some uh, strong industry ties kind of in terms of uh, helping connect uh, uh, telehealth providers with, with the, the broader healthcare world, but they have these, these special interest groups. Uh, they get together, they're uh, focused on specific clinical specialties and specific problems within telehealth, and they produce what they call practice guidelines, uh, where they kind of explain how do you deliver uh, healthcare through telemedicine if you're a dermatologist, if you're a mental health provider, a pediatrician, and so they uh, provide these practice guidelines to help clinicians really understand what delivering telemedicine might look like. Uh, the, the world of telemedicine is actually pretty big. There, there are a lot of ways of delivering it. Uh, a lot of us right now are looking at telemedicine perhaps as kind of what we're doing now. We're on a video call. Uh, we might talk to you know, video or Zoom or FaceTime with, with a doctor. And that, that is a really key part of it. But there's this whole other world of monitoring patients with chronic conditions remotely from their home uh, and kind of helping uh, prevent them from having complications in their condition that result in higher, more expensive, more challenging levels of care and, and worse health outcomes. Uh, there's some kind of messaging applications that we can also use. Uh, really, it's all about how do we help deliver care closer to home and, and keep patients where, where they typically want to be when they're recovering and managing their, their health. Uh, so, so these are the telehealth resources. On the next slide, uh, there are some uh, really, really just brief list of some of the topics I'll be talking about a little bit later in terms of how do we make it so telehealth is more feasible uh, throughout Alaska. There are a lot of things that are really great in Alaska in terms of telehealth, but we still do have some challenges. So these are just links if you want to uh, read more uh, on some of the things that I say here uh, uh, moving ahead. Uh, so on the next slide, we have a, a picture of Alaska uh, to scale. Um, and it is really representative of the uh, tribal healthcare referral network that we have across Alaska. And I think it's really remarkable for a couple of reasons. First off, the scale. We often in Alaska, we know that we're a big state, but when we really think about what does it mean to have to access resources across the state? How do we deliver care across the state? You know, we're trying to manage patients uh, in, in a very, very massive geographic space. Uh, and Often a key part of delivering care in our communities and, and providing health care to, to our, our villages has been dependent on travel. Uh, and in the face of COVID, there's this question of what do we do when we can't travel, but we still need to provide care. Uh, you know, we want to keep patients home, um, both uh, right now with, with COVID being a concern to reduce exposure to infectious disease, but we also want to keep them again home where their families are, where their communities are, and uh, in, in places that uh, will ultimately help them uh, recover uh, in the, with the care network they need. And then you know, reducing unnecessary travel is also a really kind of important, important thing we can do with telemedicine. Now, Alaska has really a pretty strong history in telemedicine. I would say we're actually pioneers in this space. Uh, a long time ago, we were using CB radios to help community health aides and villages talk to providers in, in uh, hub communities and in hospitals. Then about 25 to 30 years ago, we started having some of our tribal health partners doing really innovative work using video conferencing. Um, and, and they did some initial pilot projects checking the feasibility of seeing patients remotely over video. And then for about the past 20 years, there's been this really joint effort with tribal health organizations around the state as we try and figure out how do we develop a really robust telehealth network 
to connect our most rural villages uh, to regional hospitals, uh, to the specialty care that we offer here in Anchorage, then also to specialists beyond uh, in the lower 48. And we've done that quite successfully. And we have a number of programs where we're working with you know, top level physicians uh, in, in the uh, continental US uh, in the contiguous lower 48, and we are able to have our patients stay home and still see those top level doctors. Now, one of the issues with the model as it existed kind of pre-COVID was that it was about clinic to clinic consultations. It required a patient to show up in the physical facility, often be presented by a community health aide or a mid-level, maybe a primary care doctor. And that patient would then be presented to another distant provider, uh, generally over video conferencing uh, or over the store and forward kind of medical email system that we have. And some challenges with that, you know, we're tying up two healthcare resources for that one appointment. Uh, and there are some inefficiencies that can occur where if either party is running late, if the patient is slow to get to the clinic, uh, or if the clinic is, is slow to connect to the video visit, or the uh, doctor in Anchorage is running behind uh, with their own patient load, for any one person, you know, being delayed, we're, we're having uh, slowness in the ability to receive care, and it can cause some, some delays and some frustration. And now in COVID, we don't even necessarily even have that option where we can get into the clinic. Uh, patients are being asked to stay home and reduce exposure uh, to clinic staff. And so we need to connect to patient homes. We have had some success here. We've seen about a six to 9% increase in telemed traffic, uh, primarily to homes, uh, but we still are struggling with one really big problem. And that is how do we pro uh, ensure that there's adequate connectivity in each home? Uh, based on some reports that I've seen, about over 40% of our communities are still only with 2G coverage for their cell phones, which can't support data, doesn't support video calls. And so the things that we can take for granted along the rail belt and in some of the more urban centers here, you know, hopping on a Zoom call on our phone, that just fundamentally isn't an option in some of these communities that we have. Uh, so the other option is maybe try using home-based connections. Uh, and here, for a lot of them, they're still capped at perhaps a one megabit per second download and a 256 kilobit per second upload, which uh, is quite slow. And some of the video platforms will work on such a, a low speed connection, but it isn't going to be a very good video call. You might have kind of freezing and jittering, the audio might get garbled, which is really important for trying to do medical evaluations at a distance. We also have data caps that we're looking at, you know, seven gigabytes of data can get burned through very quickly if we're doing, you know, 30 minute or hour long uh, uh, video visits with our providers and patients. Now, some of our, none of our communities are at such a, a reduced bandwidth. Some of them are on, you know, six megabyte per second and two megabit per second, two, excuse me, six megabit per second download speeds and two megabit per second upload speeds. Uh, they're paying a pretty high price for that, you know, $150 a month. Uh, but still, that's fallen far short of the FCC definitions of what broadband really is, which is 25 megs down and 3 megs up. Now, if we're trying to ask our families to work from home, school to occur over uh, you know, computers in the home, and the patients to receive medical care at the home, they fundamentally won't be able to do all three of those things on the low speeds that we see in a lot of our villages. Now, when we first started developing clinic-to-clinic -clinic telemedicine, there wasn't a lot of great connectivity. Uh, definitely not a lot of great broadband and a lot of work a lot of money went into changing that and it's improved and now most of our clinics really can support video conferencing fairly easily but fundamentally we're still not into the home yet now covid has introduced some changes to legislation uh, around and uh, legislation and emergency orders around uh, where care can be delivered who's allowed to deliver care how we get reimbursed and paid for the care that is delivered um, and a lot of things have been loosened and relaxed that were previously stopping telemedicine from surging ahead into the home. And all of that has been at least temporarily kind of uh, loosened. There's a lot more telemedicine happening nationwide as well as in the state. But we can't deliver bandwidth to the home as quickly as we can deliver legislation to the floor. And so looking to the future, we really need to figure out how are we going to ensure there's equity in access to broadband services around the state. A few interesting things are happening uh, in the future. They're, they're uh, actually fairly near at hand in some cases. Uh, the FCC is opening up something that they're calling the 2.5 gigahertz wireless spectrum. Uh, there's some uh, wireless capacity that will be available and then tribes are able to actually apply uh, for a license to this spectrum, which would allow them to set up their own local wireless networks. Uh, and there's some preference and priority happening around uh, this project for tribes. 
Now, there's still a problem here where networks still need to connect to the internet. It's great if we could cover our villages with you know, adequate uh, uh, network connectivity, but if it's not getting back to a, a you know, nice fat connection to, to the main public internet, we'll still have issues. Because uh, right now we're still going to be dependent on a lot of the existing telecommunications infrastructure that's been put out, whether it's fiber, whether it's cable that's been run, whether we have microwave repeaters, uh, we're still dependent on those systems to deliver that, that um, connectivity to our home. There's a really interesting opportunity that uh, a number of companies are pursuing around low earth orbit satellites. I may have heard of some of these. Uh, Starlink is one that's pretty uh, you're getting a lot of news right now. It's through SpaceX and Elon Musk's, Musk's company. There are others. Um, uh, OneWeb uh, it just went through is going through bankruptcy filing and will possibly get their satellites you know, made available to somebody else. The, the core thing, though, is there are a number of companies trying to make it so that we could have high speed, low latency satellite connections into our home. In the existing satellites, you have a, a one second delay. There's limit to exactly what, how, what the throughput can be on some of those connections. Uh, the low Earth satellite offers a chance for uh, better connectivity, faster connectivity to the home that could then uh, piggyback on this 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, but to potentially allow us to have new telecommunication services, possibly tribally run, uh, that allow us to, to improve and control some of the access we have in our home communities. Now, funding for this is a bit of a challenge. Uh, so there are some grant opportunities out there, at least for some of the equipment, uh, the USDA, Health Resources and Services Administration uh, and the FCC uh, through the, the USAC funds. There are options for funding, but uh, there is gonna need to be a pretty big, I think, uh, investment in time and money to get the, the connectivity where we need it to be to provide equity of access to the patient home, both for healthcare, but also for schooling uh, and for play. And so uh, with that, I, I uh, know that we're, we have a couple other excellent speakers uh, that have uh, additional uh, new topics to cover. And so I would like to transition over to Jessica uh, and, and her presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Garrett, for that informative presentation. Quite a bit of chat going on in the box for you to read as far as like what you were saying and very interesting. Masicho. Shojri Jessica Oji, Gwichajik, what's on Ishli, God Tanan Gwichi. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jessica Black. I go by she, her. I am living on the traditional homelands of the Chena Hultani, the, the lower Tanana Athabascan, and I work at Trathyadat, which is UAF campus, but it's uh, it's technically Trathia Dit. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. I will apologize ahead of time. I have a five-year-old and a tiny puppy and I'm literally running away from them. Um, it seems like whenever I try to do a webinar or something, they want to be right in my lap, but uh, that's just the balance of life, I suppose. So today I'm gonna be talking with you all a little bit about food security and food sovereignty. And I wanna just contextualize a little bit what I'm about to say, cause I think that's really important. I grew up in Fort Yukon, Gwichaje, but I also grew up in Ninana, Tagatili. And from the time I was born, um, or prior, you know, in, in my mother's womb, I had the opportunity to go to fish camp, um, live a very uh, traditional or subsistence lifestyle with my family. And when we moved to Ninana, I was um, brought into the loving arms of the Athabascan people of Ninana. So very grounded in the different Dana cultures uh, my own Gwich'in and also uh, the Lord Tanana Athabascan and Ninana. And so the passion and the fire I have for this topic is something that was passed down to me from my parents, from my grandparents, my great grandparents, this long line of connection um, and knowledge that is passed on in living. And um, it's just always been a part of who I am. So 
I have to always recognize my family, my elders, my aunties, my uncles, my whole communities for instilling in me this pride, this knowledge. And I have a responsibility to um, also share that knowledge with others and pass it on. Food has always been central to my life. And I would even say to ind indigenous people's lives globally, but we're talking here in Alaska and it is integral to our wellness and who we are. I think about our times of celebration, our times of sorrow, um, difficulty. We often get through those times by sharing food um, for my family and many others. It's, you know, gathering with tea and uh, dry fish or uh, dry meat, whatever you have to share with someone else. And so, um, when we talk about food security, we're for as an Alaska Native person, we're really talking about food that comes from the land. Right now, my family just finished um, hunting for birds, and um, it was such a joyful occasion. My cousin and his son went out, and they had an opportunity um, for a successful hunt, and they were able to share what they got with other people. So when we're talking about food security, we're, we're really um, talking about food from the land. And um, by doing that, by going out on the land and harvesting, if you're lucky, you are carrying on not only um, the ability to put food in your freezer, but you're carrying on many important traditions and you're passing on knowledge from generation to generation. And so as a native person, we rely on the land, animals and water to provide for us. And we in turn provide for them. So we live according to the symbiotic relationship. And I always say, um, according to our values, there's a really powerful article by LaDonna Harris and um, it's called the four R's, reciprocity, relationship, responsibility, and redistribution. And so I always talk about um, that article and I ask my students to read it because it really underpins what I'm talking about here when I say we rely on an animals, land and waters to provide for us and they in turn provide, we provide for them. So we care for the land and we steward the land and the land cares for us based on our values. And this is what really gives us our wellness. Now, given this 10,000 plus year experience, generational knowledge built over time, it doesn't, um, every time a generation uh, inherits this knowledge and is responsible for passing it on, it just builds in, um, I don't want to say credibility, but that knowledge is cumulative, right? And so you have all of this experience. I have all this experience from my ancestors and my cousins and my uncles and my nieces living on the land daily, seeing what's going on, um, making sure that food security, um, that they have the food that they need and that the water is doing well and the land's doing well. And yet, we are largely left out as Native people, um, management decisions that ultimately affect our well being. And the reasons for that are very complex. They come back to um, land governance issues, um, the political and historical context of colonialism that is ongoing and living today. So I get worked up about this because as an indigenous person with all this knowledge passed down from my family and ancestors and a deep, deep relationship with the land that gives me wellness um, to be left largely out of conversations around governance on what happens to the land is very upsetting. And we've seen the ramifications of the indigenous perspective and knowledge system being left out of these decisions. Um, 
we've seen uh, fisheries crashes historically and to date. We've seen uh, decimated populations of moose in certain areas. We've seen um, marine mammals that have also um, suffered, but also thrived when indigenous governance comes into the picture. So we see examples of what happens when uh, indigenous populations are left out of these very important decisions that affect food sovereignty and also food security. And um, so as we think of food sovereignty, we really need to th critically think about the institutions and how to shift those institutions and policy to better reflect these different ways of knowing, right? How can we integrate um, knowledge system, not underneath Western knowledge, but as its own intact knowledge system? How can we promote indigenous uh, governance, indigenous self-governance? Um, there's so much work going on in this realm. One example is I have a project called Indigenizing Salmon Science and Management, where we're bringing indigenous knowledge into, um, we're doing some, some focus groups and interviews to document the depth and breadth of indigenous knowledge around salmon management and governance. And we're <clears throat> hopefully are going to be able to use that to help shift policy to better reflect a more holistic intact um, system that honors both indigenous, the best of indigenous knowledge and Western science as their own intact knowledge system. And you know what, quite frankly, we have to do it. The time is past due because in order to um, promote this wellness that I started out with, this wellness that is based on values and based on relationships between people, land, waters, animals, we're going to have to shift institutions. We're gonna to have to ensure that everybody has an opportunity to participate meaningfully in these systems. Um, and I would say as an indigenous person, it needs to be indigenous led because we've been here 10,000 years and we know um, this, these lands, we know these waters and we've taken care of them. And honestly, when that happens, everybody benefits because we're thinking holistically. And so when I think of a just transition, I'm thinking transition back to these values, back to this holistic way of living, um, back to honoring different knowledge systems, not just honoring them, but promoting them. And we need that to be well physically, spiritually, emotionally. And we need that because the land needs that from us as well. So I'll end there just because I can go on for hours. Um, I am so grateful for this opportunity. I love to see all your beautiful faces on the screen and see your names in the, the box. I am happy to discuss one-to-one -one with anyone. I've had this vision ever since I was a little girl and it's coming into being because that's what our ancestors do. They pray and they, they, um, they push people into the places that they need to be. So thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Jessica, for um, speaking so well to just the importance of food and land to our health and um, really um, just bringing out so, so many important um, things for us to think about in that conversation. So um, yeah, a lot of gratitude. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Layla Pyle. Um, I am the next speaker, uh, also talking about um, issues of um, food access and um, 
from a little bit of a different perspective. So I'm the lead educator at um, Calypso Farm and Ecology Center in uh, Fairbanks um, on the lands of the Lower Tanana Dene peoples. Um, I uh, just a, a quick background. I, I grew up in um, Kodiak on uh, Supiak lands um, and uh, have been in Alaska my whole life. And my background is in education. So um, at Calypso, we are an educational farm um, and we offer hands-on programs to community members um, as well as growing uh, local food and encouraging um, relationships with, uh, with food production and environmental awareness. And so um, I'm gonna be sharing today about my perspective um, working at Calypso um, on food security and food justice. Um, during this time and um, some some aspects of Calypso's uh, response um, from a from our uh, like agricultural um, food, food distribution perspective. Um, I'm also an organizer with uh, Fireweed Collective, which is a new uh, organization of young Alaskans um, really working towards um, towards a just transition and um, thinking about how we build a future for um, our next, you know, our, our generations uh, to come in Alaska and how we can really make it and look really different and shape it. Um, and so, yeah, there'll be more about that in the next um, webinar. So y'all should definitely tune into that too, but um, just a quick shout out. Um, so you'll also see a few pictures just kind of um, go by as I'm talking and just like of Calypso, just to give you some context of the size of our operations. Um, and also there'll be some nice pictures of uh, <laughs> the full garden from last year, which is just um, amazing how much food we can grow in Alaska. Um, so at Calypso, we usually focus on um, education and food production. Um, but this year we're mostly focused on food production and growing food in our garden um, directly for food relief for our community um, and those that are in, in need uh, during this time. So I'll share a bit more about some of the details of our um, response throughout the rest of the presentation, but I just wanted to first kind of give um, a little bit of my perspective and a bigger picture and thinking about a just transition and recovery and really what um, what that means and how uh, growing food and local food and agriculture kind of fits into this bigger picture of changing our economy. Um, so again, so much appreciation for um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Black for really grounding us in um, the history of this place and the, the, the really deep meaning of food sovereignty. Um, and what it means to be in relationship with the land and the food that uh, you know gives us our health. And so, um, food sovereignty, food security is so important. We all maybe you know every day, but have experienced in this crisis too. Maybe thinking about um, you know what it what it means to to be um, unsure of of the future, where our food might come from. And so, thinking about this from an agricultural perspective looks really different than uh, a subsistence um, one. So, you know, the systems that we have in place, um, you know, subsistence might look like you and your family going out fishing, hunting, going to fish camp, uh, you know, gathering, sharing with your community. Um, and that food system, uh, you know, looks really different maybe than a, a farm that has people working on it, but distributes food throughout the community. And so just thinking about these different pieces of our, um, you know, shifting our food economy is going to be really important. Um, and also just want to acknowledge that um, the kind of land relationship uh, that that comes with agriculture really needs to be um, like talked about and acknowledged um, in these conversations as we all um, think about, especially Alaska. Um, so there was not, you know, looking at these pictures of Calypso, there, there wasn't, um, you know, cultivation of, of food in this way historically. Um, you know, Jessica was talking about uh, native food systems. Um, and so farming um, just inherently has, has gone hand in hand with a lot of the, you know, settler colonialism that has happened across um, the Americas. And so, including um, Alaska. And so just talking about 
farming and agriculture moving forward, we, you know, as we also talk about how, how do we have indigenous led um, decision making in, in land uh, management and, and resource management, how do we also, um, you know, talk about what equity looks like in terms of growing food and um, acknowledging that colonial history, um, you know, who has access to land, who has access to big, you know, big pieces of land um, where you can grow food. Um, and on the other hand, you know, thinking about our, our communities and, and populations and just, you know, moving forward into the future together, um, you know, that growing food might be a, a really big part of how we how we shift our food economies into a just transition. So thinking about all these pieces is, is really important. Um, and so I think the biggest point I want to make um, around what I've kind of learned and witnessed from Calypso's response, um, really shifting our food, uh, food production to, to really um, meeting the needs of our community is um, that uh, strong community networks have been so important. And so when we're thinking about our aspirational food systems um, as we you know, shift these economies, um, it's more than just individuals growing food. It's, you know, it's, um, it's the way that we grow and distribute food for our communities. Um, and so at Calypso, we're, we're really lucky because we have had a lot of um, community, community networks in place. Um, and so we're really, um, we're an educational entity as well. And so we have relationships with schools and um, various uh, neighborhoods of Fairbanks where we've and, um, uh, you know, different farms uh, around uh, Fairbanks. And so when we um, were really in the like adapting mode and, and uh, you know, initial response mode a couple months ago, we, um, we really thought about how could we activate our networks in order to get food not only to people who can you know afford to buy a, a csa share but really those who need food and and need food not only you know when they lost their job you know a month ago but going into you know four months from now six months from now um and really recognizing that recovery is not it, you know it's not just the aid of the, the you know the one-time check but it's that people are going to be feeling the economic um, repercussions of this for for months to come, and so we really recognize the need to shift our um, focus of growing this this summer to really be able to um, perf provide direct um, food relief. So, just a couple ways that that looks is um, uh, growing food in our um, th three school gardens that we manage in Fairbanks. Um, and being able to partner with community organizations like the Senior Center and different social um, uh, service like family organizations to um, identify families and individuals in need and just get food, um, you know, directly distributed for free. Um, changing our distribution systems um, instead of having farmers markets where people are, you know, sharing a lot of personal space to um, really putting people's health first um, and making sure that, um, you know, those that are are in need of uh, food and people who we have um, community relationships are um, also receiving, receiving these. And so, um, yeah, I think that um, what I would, what I would iterate is that if we, as we think about food as a and food systems as a microcosm, almost of our bigger economy that we want to shift as one sector. Um, you know, as we change the way that we manage our home, um, and we transition away from, uh, you know, more unreliable food networks that are also destructive. Um, you know, big scale agriculture, big grocery stores that we've seen, you know, exploiting workers throughout this crisis. That um, we just have to also think aspirationally and seriously about what we mean um, by you know, putting these different systems and alternative systems in practice and really uplifting community networks. Um, and um, as, as we also really 
uh, acknowledge and uplift that that food is deeply personal, um, as Jessica was talking about also, and it ties all of these issues together, health and land and culture and community. And so um, it's a really powerful piece of this. And um, yeah, look forward to continuing these conversations. If anyone um, you know has questions and wants to reach out to me, I'll um, put some contact info in the chat. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Pass it back to our moderators. Great, thank you to all of our speakers. I think you gave us you know, a lot to think about and really appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know we could have just one webinar for each of you. So I encourage folks to look at all the different um, things that are being dropped into the chat. Um, there's some follow-up information going out there. So um, again, thank you. And we'll share out the slides and the information um, afterwards. So um, it's great information. We are moving to a fishbowl. So we're doing things a little bit different um, instead of going out into breakout sessions if you were on our previous ones. So some best ways if, to view the fishbowl, if you turn off your video, except for the speakers, make sure your videos are on. And all lines are gonna be muted. However, I do wanna encourage everyone to participate. While there's gonna be within the discussion of the members that are part of the fishbowl, I want to have, you know, people to provide your feedback and questions that you might have and be engaging through the chat. And we'll make sure to, you know, try to uplift your comments as we can. And this is just a way for us to engage in another way to talk about um, a lot of the things that we have going on in Just Transition. So if we could go to the next slide. So this is the question that we are going to be looking at. How do we create resiliency for our communities while we recover from these crises? In addition, what policy or program solutions are we uncovering now that we can build towards a just transition in Alaska? And if we could also drop that question into the chat um, so folks can see that as we move to the other slide. And I forgot to introduce myself when I first started, so I'll do that now. Um, Kendra Kloster, uh, she, her pronouns. I am on Denina lands. I'm Clinkett, originally from Wrangell and Juneau are my hometowns, but I've been in Anchorage for probably about 10 years now. Um, I'm the mother of two amazing children, and that's really my favorite role in life, although I'm also the executive director of Native People's Action and Native People's Action Community Fund. And I'm going to hand it over to our fishbowl participants so they can introduce themselves and then we will get into our discussion. I hand it over to Marna. Hello, everyone. My name is Marna Sanford. I, I work at Tanana Chiefs Conference in Interior, Alaska. We represent 37 federally recognized tribes and 42 communities. I live in Fairbanks on the lands of the Tanana Kwatana, uh, the Lower China. And um, at Tanana Chiefs, I work on policy and legislation. And that's uh, been something that has been keeping me very busy. And I'm excited to participate with you all today. Thank you. Jasmine, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Jasmine has been pretty okay. I may have had some mental health crisis. Um, I am a entrepreneur and I own multiple businesses in Anchorage. I also like to. Um, I'm having a hard time hearing. Jasmine, is anyone else? Sorry. Yeah, me too. Okay, okay. let me see if I can switch phones. Is it not working? You're really quiet. Okay, I'm gonna see if I can switch maybe to my other phone. I'm not sure what it is. I'm gonna log off and log back. Okay, go ahead. We'll just keep going with introductions and uh, Jasmine can 
jump back on and join us. Good afternoon, Carrie Stevens, Sauza, Maryland Hudson, Sukun Ben Stevens, Bauza, Sedina Drachi, Hechadiam Bauza, Dini Hutana Hudson, Fairbanks Lesdo, Itaa Albert Supik Bauza, Inaa Patricia Supik Bauza, Marilyn Lida. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carrie Stevens, and I was uh, speaking in Danaka. My husband and my son are Dini Khatana, people of the canyon, Stevens Village. I'm from Maryland and uh, my family still lives in Maryland. I am tribal management faculty um, at University of Alaska Fairbanks and I'm also a founding steering committee of MPA. It's good to be with all of you today. Wonderful. I'll go next. My name is Saskia Esslinger, and um, I'm calling in from Denina lands. I use she, her pronouns. And I was born in Anchorage, and I'm living in Homer right now. Um, and I am the owner of Teach Gardening. It's um, a business that I created to teach people how to grow their own food and um, to help grow the garden economy. So I'm very excited to be here today to talk about how um, home gardens can um, aid in the transition to a just economy and, um, and support our resiliency. So thanks for inviting me. And pass it on to the next person. So I'm checking in to see if uh... Jasmine made it back on. We will go ahead and jump into our conversation. And I know Jasmine will be able to jump back in pretty quickly. But again, I just want to, for this, it's just really a conversation between all of us. We do a lot of work um, and in many different ways of, of getting involved in the just transition. And sometimes when people bring this up to me too. And they say, well, oh man, we're not doing the just transition work. And I say, no, you are, you're part of this and you're part of the efforts that you do. And when thinking about all the work that's being done across the state, um, there's just so many people that are out there doing it. And I, I think it's important to highlight the work. And I just want to really question what we wanted to get into, but this we open up to many topics. How do we create resilience for our communities while we are recovering from this crisis. I'm just going to throw it out there to the group. You can jump on in. Well, I see this, um, this crisis as a really amazing opportunity um, for us to um, empower ourselves to grow our own food and take hold of this really essential need that we all have. And um, this helps us in so many different ways. In one, it, um, it gives us sovereignty over our own food and control over the healthfulness of it um, so that we're not consuming chemicals that is in all industrial food. And um, it helps us to reduce our need for money or for um, the cash economy and can put us into more of a barter economy and um, reduce our need for money overall. Um, and this is just a wonderful opportunity right now while people are really thinking about um, the fragility of our food system and um, what is, um, you know, the, the, I, the, that they've seen the empty, grocery store shelves and they've heard the reports that our food supply might not be as stable as they think it is. Um, and combined with the fact that people are being asked to stay at home, they're being asked um, not necessarily to spend time commuting back and forth to work, not going on vacations, not traveling around the world. Now they're being asked to stay home. And what better way than to connect with their 
their children, their families, their grandmothers to um, learn how to grow their own food and um, supply this for the families. So um, I could go on and on, but I'd love to hear what other people have to say about this. I have to say that this was the, it was the pandemic that I've been wanting to join a, a CSA forever and finally did it because of this. Um, I'm, a, I don't know that I would ever call myself a gardener. I wish I was. I probably need to take your class, but it was this exact thing that finally motivated me to get, to get going. And so, I, I mean, I think you're exactly right that it's this, it's these kinds of things where you're forced to look at your supply chain and where you're getting your food. And even those of us on this call who, of course, I think are probably aware that it's brought it home, you know, even more so, at least, you know, I think so. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've gotten a lot of messages and we're, we're starting to do things online with just friends, like of learning how to garden and, um, some of my friends' kids actually uh, really jumped on the bandwagon and started um, building raised flower beds and started doing kind of their own business and really seeing the uptick of people starting to garden and really to have their own food sources and I which I think is so important. And on top of that, when I, when I think about what I'm putting in my body and not wanting to have a lot of those processed foods as well and thinking about what I'm giving to my children. Um, and that's also a really big, um, big thing for me. And so I, I'm trying to grow my own foods and something I've been thinking about for a long time, but have uh, made more efforts to go forward. And even some of our staff meetings, we start uh, talking and sharing what we're doing to um, to be more self-sustaining at home. Right on. I think that food security and food sovereignty is of course at the heart of just transition and of being resilient. And I wanna quote um, one of our other MPA steering committee members, uh, Lagunai, Liz Medicine Crow, the president and CEO of First Alaskans Institute, and as I often refer to her, Sensei. We are starving for equity, for the health of our lands, waters, and animals, for our spiritual well being, for our cultural well being, for state and national leadership that recognizes the strength and richness that tribal governments provide, for our languages to be spoken by all of us for meaningful government to government relationships. We have in fact been made to starve for these essential rights of our life for our native peoples for over 200 years. And the pandemic has only highlighted this. And I share that quote because starvation became a tool of the state and the federal governments in the request by tribal governments during the pandemic to feed themselves uh, with their wild foods um, in a way that makes them whole um, and in a way where they're simply taking care of themselves in a very just and sustainable manner that hurts absolutely no one. And it is this constant and continued criminalization of indigenous peoples to feed themselves that must be called out in a just transition. And uplifting tribal governance, tribal sovereignty, tribal self-determination, allowing tribal communities to simply feed themselves and not be criminalized is a necessary initial first step. I get, um, as, as Dr. Black shared, um, very passionate and emotional on this topic um, because it's 
it really is a phenomenal state of affairs in 2020 that yet Alaska Native peoples continue to be disenfranchised from decision-making arenas that affect their wild food systems and the entirety of their ways of life. And so what do we do about that? How do we work to create that resiliency? What uh, programs um, and policies can we uplift um, during uh, this just transition and during the pandemic? Um, one is just individually supporting tribal self-governance on an individual level and on a professional level. Well, how do we do that? Um, when you work with community, do you recognize the tribally elected leaders? Do you ask their permission for who or what you're working on or with? to be in their community? Um, are we uplifting and upholding um, all of the tribal policies put in place in response to the pandemic? Um, and are we recognized not only the indigenous lands that we're um, on, and I think I forgot in my introduction to say, uh, I am on Diné lands here in Fairbanks, but are we also recognizing the elected officials of uh, those places and the, and the leaders? And I think that uh, allowing Alaska Natives to feed themselves um, on Alaska Native lands, uplifting legislation and policies that do that. Um, we saw the tribal recognition bill um, enter into the legislature, um, which was a huge lift um, this legislative season, passed the House, um, and then uh, kind of died in committee, and didn't make it to the Senate. Well, we can all call our representatives and our senators in the next legislative session and demand that uh, Alaska recognize tribal governments and in fact, quit suing them. We sue tribal governments more than any other state in the United States. And we need to check ourselves and stop using the word rural. It is indigenous erasure in the state. We have rural student services at UAF. That's a political decision. At UAA, they have native uh, student services. Um, and we have to call into question the terms that we choose to use. Um, and so those are some individual things. And as you know, I'll get very passionate on this topic. Um, and I really encourage everyone to read Survival Denied because it's the stories of the people. And I think Jessica has the link. And it tells individual stories of criminalization so that you can feel the heart and soul of people who've been ticketed, fined, um, who have hurt themselves because they were hunting or fishing and they thought they heard law enforcement. Um, this is a really internalized criminalization that's occurring in the state over food. I just want to add on to that a little bit where I, what Carrie said, you know, we have legislation going forward of recognizing tribes, which is surprising that we don't have that in the state of Alaska, but I want to see it go even further. We need actual government to government relationships. Um, I, I, and recognize the work that our tribes are doing and give them the power to do that. And it's so frustrating that it's something that we're having to ask for. It's something that should already be in our constitution. It should be inherent. We should be able to, you know, tribes be able to govern themselves and our tribal citizens. So I, I just want to encourage that we can continue to um, push more on the policy levels, but also get involved into other into boards, commissions, where other places that we can uplift our work and be involved and without, you know, if we want to change the system, my, my idea is to get involved and be able to change the system is be there and have that seat at the table and starting to demand a seat at the table. I've seen, you know, BLM, uh, Bureau of Land Management, just pushing on um, their, their plans forward without really taking into account 
um, the tribes without allowing citizens to just be involved in the process and they just roll over them. And so I'm seeing this time and time again and, and just really wanting to call that out and call it to action for the people that are on the phone and, and even more. And so thank you, Carrie, for bringing that up. And I want to allow just, a, you know, we have only five minutes left on this call. I know we had a lot of awesome speakers and I just want to allow um, some maybe kind of closing comments from this fishbowl. And I know we could probably continue this conversation for a long time and we're getting cut short a little bit and my apologies. Um, so Jasmine, if you want to um, jump in, I know that you called in. I just want to give you a minute to say something. Can everybody hear me better now? Yes. Okay, good. That makes me very happy. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, like I, I've heard a lot of great comments today and, and um, you know, feedback and ideas. And I think the only things I really wanted to contribute to the conversation is going back to the first question about, like, what has come out of this whole experience what we're going through. And I can say from my community standpoint and me just as an individual as, as advocate and a parent, I've always been very busy and I do spend time with my family and my kids, but I think this whole experience and what we've been going through and encountering lately, at least in my community, has reminded us how important family is and has reminded us how crucial it is for us to go back to the basics and really instill not only our cultural values, but our self-advocacy and our pride values and our children. And the thing that I can say that, you know, during all of this and just this whole conscious of death movement is what we've been doing with regards to this year and COVID is like not only supplies for our people and our businesses, but also teaching them how to make their own, like how to make your own hand sanitizer, how to make your own mask, and then teaching our kids that as well. And I guess my, my biggest takeaway is, is in this, you know, as we move forward and figure out the next step for our people in our communities of color, especially we, we don't forget the youth piece of that and, and teaching them early and getting them comfortable with our speech and our ways and our work so that it's a natural progression when it's time for them to, you know, take the torch when we pass that on. So that's really all I wanted to kind of contribute as well. I know we're getting close to the time, but if um, you're okay, we can stay over a couple minutes, but I just wanted to allow any closing thoughts from, from additional members here. I actually thought that there, there were so many things that people tied together here. Saskia is talking about um, being, you know, noticing our food shortages. And then as Carrie is talking about her, uh, her points with regards to criminalizing people who are attempting to to figure out those food shortages in their traditional ways. I know at Tanana Chiefs Conference, we're dealing with both of those as, as our supply chains to uh, our communities was severely hampered. And that's stuff that, you know, doesn't make the news in Fairbanks or Anchorage. So, you know, I, I think there was something that had, um, I don't know, I saw something online about how one of the celebrities was all talking about how, you know, I don't remember quite how it went, but we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. That, and I think that when we look at Alaska and how the folks who are in communities that aren't, certainly who aren't on, have access to the road and how um, our, particularly our indigenous communities have, have not had the same, they're not on the same boat as so many of us. And one of the things I was going to bring up, which Garrett actually covered really well, was internet access. I know that we're all here on this Zoom call and in our communities, this isn't something that's available to them. And we don't think about that. People come in all the time and say that they're going to give uh, access to rural Alaska. And they, they, 
and they promise the world, but no one actually wants to invest in the infrastructure that's needed. And that's true with food security as well. So anyway, just some thoughts. Well, thank you for, for everyone for jumping on. And I know that uh, Polly's waiting to do our to do the closeout. Um, I hope that we can continue these conversations and do you know future webinars where we, we didn't even get into the second question where we talk about policies. And I know we can go off on the different policies, although we touched on it a little bit um, on things that we can do of ensuring we're recognizing tribal sovereignty and pushing that legislation and government to government relationships. But there's so much more too that we didn't even get a chance to talk with. And so, um, you know, one thing I just wanna throw in there is making sure that when we're doing recovery efforts is where we really talk about home, economy and home is how are we ensuring, you know, childcare is part of this plan and how are we taking care of our families as we're reopening the economy and so, I just wanted to make sure that I throw that out as, as a mother and Jasmine and I have had a lot of these conversations and Polly and with many others, um, of how are we, re when we look into reimagine, how are we gonna reimagine that? How are we gonna make sure that we are in, our, in the policies and people that they're pushing forward, that our kids are taken care of, that our families are supported? You know, and, and what are those ways that we can do that? And I think that that's something that everyone on this call could be calling, talking with their legislator, putting out op-eds, calling the governor, um, you know, calling our federal delegation too, of saying, what are we doing on the federal level to be supporting families and putting them at the center of our economy, of our home? So again, thank you. I, I look forward to more conversations and I'm gonna pass it over to Polly. Wow. Um... Thank you um, to all of these incredible speakers. Um, we're just going to do a very uh, brief closing. Uh, my name is Polly Carr. She, her pronouns work with the Alaska Center calling in from um, Denina lands. Our speakers reminded us uh, just now that economy is management of home and that right now we are seeding change for how we want to take care of our home into the future. And just some reflection questions for us as we um, depart today. You know, how do we integrate the systems that have been siloed and how do we reconnect ourselves to the land and the water? How do we practice and support self-determination and support Alaska native decision-making? And Alaska Just Transition requires indigenous leadership. How do we support that? And how do we advance policy to make our ideas durable? You heard a few things mentioned. We are gonna be launching a policy webinar series to address how we can move ideas forward and we'd love you to join. As always, contact elected leaders and put your ideas forward. Um, and while our governor thinks everything is fine, we know it's not. And we know that we can shape what is possible. This is our time, this is your time. We've got to put it forward. I'm going to hand it to Linnea, who will prepare us for our next conversation and close us out. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm, thank you, Polly. I'm Linnea. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here calling from Aquan and Takuquan lands. And I also, um, just first off, I want to add that we want to hear your ideas. We, there were so many really rich topics of conversation brought up in this webinar, and we're running over because there's, there's this, this conversation could really go on. So we have, um, uh, we're, there's a Google form so we can hear your ideas about these future breakout sessions. And we also want to hear your ideas for, um, future topics for webinars too. Um, but our next webinar schedule that I'm really excited to introduce is the Reimagine and Rebuild on Wednesday, June 3rd. And so this is kind of taking the principles we've been discussing with a just transition and thinking about that 
how do we take this definition of economy we have now and move that forward into the future, not just necessarily in our immediate recovery, but after that five, 10, 20 years from now, what, what does that really look like to after a just transition? Um, what does that equi equitable economy um, look like in, yeah, in all aspects of our lives? in uh, where our food comes from, building a sustainable and en sustainable energy system. Um, and I think we, we're going to be imagining this not only in the context of the corona pandemic that we're dealing with, but also in the long term of how we recover um, and move past the fall, of, move past the fossil fuel extractive economy and recover from the climate crisis. So it's, there's definitely very, very big topics, but it's really exciting to kind of imagine what, what we want our economy to be. And kind of once we have that end goal, the steps to get there through, through our recovery um, and through really re-envisioning what, what our home and what our society and our governments look like. Um, so yeah, with that, I'm, very, uh, very excited. I hope to see you, um, to you guys are able to come to our next webinar. And yeah, with that, uh, go out and I hope you all enjoy this beautiful weather and take this time to plant something. And I also want to um, thank all of um, the co-hosts and all of our speakers today for the time um, for this webinar. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. And I hope, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Ms. Chish, thank you.